Hallelujah. Yeah, there is no other name given under heaven whereby men would be saved except the name of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let this, uh, let, this, let this spirit be in you, Philippians says, that was in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but gave himself and made of himself no reputation and gave his life up for sin. And because of that, he's worthy to be worshiped and praised that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue should confess that Jesus is Christ to the glory of God the Father. And believe me, one day every knee will bow. I don't care whether you want to or not. I don't care if you believe in him or not. Uh, you're going to bow. That's all it's boiled down to. <laughs> every knee is going to bow, whether it's for worship and praise or, you know, because uh, he just broke you. You know, I mean, you're going to bow is all I can say to you. I'm glad we get to make a choice about it, aren't you? I just gladly bow before the Lord. He's the Lord of my life and has changed my life and everything about me and has given me far more in life than I could ever give back to him. And he deserves every bit of worship and praise that I can give him forever and ever. He, he does stuff even when I, when I don't even think he's doing stuff. I mean, you know, I mean it, it's amazing. I can even be griping at God. And yeah, I do every once in a while. I, just, I know some of you look stunned when I said that, but I do. <laughs> I can be griping at God about raw deal, God, raw deal. And, and, and he's still doing stuff. And, and it'll, be, it'll be just, and I'll see it, and it'll just be like, oh, my Lord. You know, then I fall on my face and repent and be so, you know, so remorseful about that. How can God be that patient? You know, how can God be that patient? Well, we're talking about uh, today disappointment. And, you know, we've spent a couple of messages talking, with, talking about some really deep emotional issues that we as humans have. And to call in this series, How to Handle Life's Hurts. Life does have hurts, right? You've experienced them. Hmm? Yeah, you have a pulse, right? Okay. That means you're going to have some more. Uh, as long as that thing's still beating right there, yeah, it's still going. Well, that means I'm still in for some that lie ahead. Uh, life is just tough that way. Life is hard that way, and that's just the way life is. No matter how spiritual you are, no matter how blessed you are, no matter how close to God and how much you sacrifice, and you could live at the church with a Bible in your hand, praying 24 hours a day, you're still going to have these hurts in life as a human being. It just, it just happens. And the first one we dealt with was rejection. And that's something that people uh, spend their whole life and never recover from, being rejected. And we dealt with how to handle rejection. You remember, you got to shake the dust off. <laughs> yeah, Jesus said, hey, if they won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. Go on to the next one. They'll receive you. But you can't drag that stuff from the past along with you or it's going to mess up your present and destroy your future. So... Rejection was something we looked at. And then last week, we looked at anger. Of course, I know none of you sweet people have to deal with anger. Um, you know, I mean, I, every once in a while, I have to. But I know you probably don't ever have to deal with anger. And nobody ever makes you mad. And, and you handle it just beautifully. We, we talked last week about a, uh, uh, an anger iceberg. And I'm just trying to make you kind of remember just a second. And you remember, anger is a warning light, right? I mean, it's all, it's all right to be angry. Look at your neighbor and say, it's, it's, it's all right to be angry. I mean, that's not a sin. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Matter of fact, I think I'll use that scripture today at some point during this message. Be angry and sin not. You can be angry and not sin. How can you not sin and be angry? Well, if you're angry at the right stuff, you know? <laughs> angry at sin, angry at rebellion, angry at rejection. Angry about the things that God would be angry about 455 times in the Old Testament, it says that God was angry. Uh, so it's possible, but uh, the warning light is when I'm angry, something's going on, and uh, most of the time, it's not what you see. It's, it's like, the, like an iceberg. You know, you see the little top of an iceberg, and you say, oh, you know, obviously, there's an iceberg, but what you don't see is that that thing is far more massive underneath the water that you can't see than that little part sticking up right there. 
And so, so anger's like that. There, there are all kind of causes and reasons and so forth. And when you see the little warning sign of anger, you know, it's just saying to you, uh, pfft, uh, whatever it is that's causing this, you got to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it, it's going to eat you up. And it's going to become way bigger than it should in your life. Now, today, we're dealing with disappointment. And I put in, in your notes uh, a little working definition. Now, this is not like some official Webster's Dictionary definition of disappointment. This is just something that I think works for what we're talking about today. Um, and, and disappointment could be defined as uh, the action of your brain readjusting to reality after discovering that things didn't work the way you thought they were going to work. When I'm disappointed, it's my brain adjusting to a new reality. The new reality is whatever just happened didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. And I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in life. Common, very common emotion that we all have to deal with because we're disappointed in so many ways, right? We're disappointed with events. You ever been to an event that you bought tickets for maybe and it was hyped up and it was going to be all of that and it was just, whoo, you looked forward to it and you had plans for it and then you got there and when you got there, it was just completely underwhelming. I mean, it was just a dud and you were disappointed. So, you know, events can disappoint, things can disappoint us. You ever looked under the Christmas tree and saw a beautiful gift with your name on it? And you were imagining what that gift might be. I mean, it's, a, it's the most beautiful package under there. It's wrapped so immaculately. It must be very precious, whatever's in there. And maybe if you're thinking you want, you know, something like some jewelry or whatever it might be, and the box is small, and you're thinking, I bet you what they got me is that ring I've been wanting, and this is going to be so nice. And then, and then you open the box. And it's a pack of Skittles or something. I mean, you know, it, people, people do that to you, right? They do that to you. They'll, they'll, they'll take a brick and put it in a little small thing, make it real heavy, so you'll think it's, whoo, man, what in the world is this, you know? And then you open it up, you know, and it's a kazoo or something. Uh, you know, it's just, and, and then they laugh. They think that's funny. They think that's funny. But you're disappointed because it wasn't that. H have you ever bought a box of cereal for the gift that's on the inside, the prize? Yeah, you look, you, look, you look on the package. I'm serious. You go to any grocery store right now. Get you a box of cereal that has a prize on the inside and look at it advertised on the box. And when you look at it advertised on the box, man, that thing is, it looks great. It's wonderful. It's a, whew, this is a, this is a majestic toy right here. And then when you open it and you get it out of there, uh, tell me if you're disappointed. It's going to be some little blue piece of plastic. It's not even colored right, and it doesn't snap together real good, and it does nothing like all of that fun on the outside of the box. And, you know, so, you know, you did, uh, things can disappoint point you. But by far, the greatest disappointments in life come from people. I mean, people can let you down, right? People can be unreliable. People are unappreciative. They tell you one thing, and and do something else. And by far, people are the biggest offenders of our lives. So one of the secrets of success would be that we would have to learn how to deal with people who disappoint us in life. Now, the Bible is filled with disappointing people. I know you're aware of this, right? I mean, the, the first two people that were born on earth, Cain and Abel, one of them was a major disappointment in life. Cain killed his own brother because his brother was honored by God and he somehow missed it, you know, and he got angry and killed his own brother. What a disappointment. Lot was a complete disappointment. He kept choosing the wrong things and going to wrong places and Abraham had to come try to rescue him a lot. And Noah, I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Noah, you know, he built an ark and was faithful to God and got on the ark and got all the animals and did everything he was supposed to do. And then when he got off the ark, his daughters got him, got him drunk and uh, did all kind of uh, vile things. Noah, yeah. Oh, what a disappointment, right? Uh, Peter was a disappointment. 
the cock's going to crow, the rooster's going to crow, and you will have already denied me three times. It'll never happen, Lord. I'll die. I'll go to prison. I'll do. You can count on the rock. The rest of them may leave you, but the rock's going to be there with you. And no sooner than that got out of his mouth, <laughs> then, then here goes the rooster. He's denied. Little old girl comes up and accuses him, and he, no, 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 no. And then the rooster crows. And, it was a horrible thing, you know. John Mark, I, I know some of you may not even know that name, but the Apostle Paul had many people that helped him on these missionary journeys that he went on. And, uh, you know, Silas, and, and, and he, had, he had lots of people that helped him, but one of them was named John Mark. He was a young guy. And John Mark got out there and, and, and was helping the Apostle Paul, and, and they got kind of in a tight where uh, things, you know, Paul really needed him. And then John Mark said, no, I, I got to go home, man. I gotta. And he left. He quit. He quit. Yeah, went home. John Mark the quitter. How would you like to be known in eternity as John Mark the quitter? <laughs> that was your name. Yeah, a lot of disappointing people in the Bible. But in the Bible, I think there is at least one character and I know you're going to think Jesus, but it's not Jesus. There is at least one character that had to deal with more disappointment from people than any other person in the Bible. And he had to learn effectively how to deal with people who disappoint you. Or, or, or he would have never been able to accomplish what God set out for him to accomplish, and that person is Moses. You know, we hear of the patience of Job, Man, Job ain't got a candle compared to Moses. I mean, how would you like to be the pastor of two to three million people and every time something went wrong, they griped and blamed you about it? That was Moses. Moses had two or three million uh, Jews out there in the middle of the desert and every time something happened in the, in the, in, on the journey or along the way or they didn't get enough water, they didn't get enough food, they didn't, they, it was too hot, it was too cold, it was too dark, the sun was too bright. I mean, anytime anything happened, they had this favorite game they loved to play. You know what the game was? Let's play Blame Moses. How about that? Yeah. And every time something happened, man, it was just Blame Moses. God was trying to mature them, and all they did was complain about everything. I think that's one reason it took them 40 years to make a three-week three -week trip across the desert. I mean, they could have they walked across the Sinai in three weeks or less. Straight out of Egypt, straight into the promised land. Three weeks. But because they didn't know how to quit griping and complaining and belly aching and grumbling, God said, all right, take another lap. Take another lap. Take another lap. All right, take another lap. Forty years later, they finally get to the promised land. You know, One time it got so bad, one time it got so bad that they accused Moses of bringing them out in the desert to, in order to kill them. Yeah, they said... They looked at Moses and said, hey, Moses, wasn't there enough graves down in Egypt? I mean, you had to bring us out here to kill us in the middle of the desert. And I'm sure Moses is sitting there going, not a bad idea. <laughs> so Moses had to deal with people problems and disappointment with people constantly. Now today, in this passage, we're going to look at some water problems that they had. Uh, first water problem they had, they had too much water at the Red Sea. You know, how are we going to get across? The second water problem was no water. They went three days after they crossed the Red Sea with no water, and they were dying, and, you know, where are we going to get some water? How are we going to get some? And then the third problem was when they did get to some water, they got to a little wide spot in the road called Mara, and Mara means bitter water, so you can imagine what the water problem here is. They didn't have any. They finally found some, but when they finally found it, they couldn't drink it because it was bitter. And so in this little brief story from the book of Exodus, we're going to get to see three lessons that Moses teaches us about dealing with disappointment with people in life. So let, let, let me just read the verses, and we'll get in here. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. Now, I, I know when you see the word wilderness, you, you have a tendency to think of, of, of forest and stuff like that. Wilderness is just, just means an uninhabited area. It means a, a place where men have not 
um, have not uh, moved in any way into this into this land. They've not cultivated it. They've not in, uh, uh, they've not helped it. It's just completely unseen and untouched by man. So it's a desert. Turn, turn your neighbor and say it's a desert. <laughs> the wilderness of Shur in woods. It's a de- it, it's a desert. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness, and they found no water. Now, when they came to Marah, uh, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah, which I've already told you means bitter water. Now, look at verse 24. And the people complained against Moses. <laughs> oh, I'm shocked. The, comp- the people complained against Moses and said, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. You see, that's capital H, which means not Moses tested them, God tested them. And God said to him, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. By the way, that's that, the, the word that's translated Lord there, I, I know that you may, some of you may be aware of this, but if you notice in your Bible, do, do any of you read, do you have a book that's called a Bible that you read? All right. All right, and even if you see it online, you're going to see th- that word Lord. You're going to see it sometimes in all capital letters. You're going to see it in, in a capital L with smaller letters. You, I mean, you're going to see that word uh, printed out in different ways. And, and what that sh- reflects is the, the, the name that was used in Hebrew for the Lord because God had lots of names. Uh, this is a Jehovah name. Jehovah means a God who makes a covenant with you. And Rapha means health. So Jehovah Rapha is the God who heals you. So that's who was here speaking, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees in the midst of the Sinai. (laughs) 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. Well, bless the Lord. So they camped there by the waters. All right, the first lesson. Disappointment is so common in life because many times it's based on our expectation. I mean, many times we disappoint our own self because our expectations are not realistic about a situation or a person or or, or a deal. And so in order to deal with disappointment, the best product is to head it off at the pass so that you have the right perspective, you understand certain things, and therefore you're, you're not disappointed. In, in other words, the way of dealing with it is, hey, let's just, let's just don't let it happen, you know? And if you'll get the proper perspective, you can really go a long way in not being a disappointed person in life because disappointment has a way of growing and building into something way worse than disappointment. I'm going to tell you that. I'll I'll talk to you a little bit about that as we go along. So here's the first lesson we learned. First lesson in dealing with disappointment is, or defeating disappointment is, realize that most mountaintop experiences are followed by a valley. Tremendous successes in life. You've had them. Wonderful things happen. You're flying high. Everything's going good. You've crossed some threshold that you've been praying for. You know, I mean, Lord, help me be this way or help me do this or help me experience this. And man, you've done it and and you're flying high. You're on the mountaintops of life, right? How many of you have ever been on a mountaintop in life? Huh? Yeah? Okay, well, believe me, I'm going to tell you because none of you have. I've been on a mountaintop because none of you raise your hand, so I know you're not done. You've been on a mountaintop in life, right? Yeah, things going good. You're happy. You're fulfilled. Everything's great. And, and, and for a while, it stays that way. But eventually, somewhere along the way, you're going to experience some failure. Now, it might not be failure concerning that high that you got on, or, but it's going to be some kind of disappointment in life that's going to drag you down because you just can't, you're not going to continue to fly high for the, 
for your whole life. Let me just tell you that. Has anybody in here been on the mountaintop uh, since they were born? You've never had a valley. Huh? All right. All right. So I am talking to the right crowd then. Now, realize that after great successes in life, that often there comes failure. After every mountaintop, usually there's about, now, now you try to avoid as many valleys as you possibly can, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic to tell you that no matter how good it is, it's going to get bad. I'm just saying, let's be real about this thing and understand that uh, we're not going to be flying high all of our life. There are going to be some challenges in life. And Moses uh, brought Israel from the Red Sea into the wilderness of Shur, and he brings them about three days out, and they can't find any water, and they finally find some water at Marah, and the water's bitter, and so the people started complaining against Moses. Only three days, three days ago, we had one of the greatest miracles that has ever happened on the face of this earth happen to us. A, a Red Sea opened up and we walked through on dry ground. I mean, we were trapped like a desert rat. I'm, uh, Pharaoh said, get out of here. And, 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 the, and, it, and the Israelites, uh, man, they went out. The Bible said they went out, you know, with a high hand and they were all, the, and, and, they, and they got down there to the Red Sea and the Red Sea was in front of them and there was a mountain called Balzaphon on one side and a mountain called uh, Pahihirath on the other side. So they were in this giant box canyon. And here comes Pharaoh after them. Boy, he's going to slaughter them. He's going to make mincemeat out of them. And Moses d d touches, the, touches the Red Sea with this rod. This God is giving him, and then all of a sudden, I mean, you've seen it on TV, right? <laughs> Woo! I mean, you watch Charlton Heston do that. And, and, and can you imagine? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Man, if I ever saw something like that, if I ever would experience something like that, you'd never have to ask me to believe God again. You'd never, I mean, I, that would be so overwhelming to me. I would never doubt. I would never forget. I would never, you know, I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Well, it was only three days before this thing that Moses was used by God, but Moses was the human standing there that opened up that Red Sea, and now just three short days later, they're griping at Moses because they don't have enough water to, to drink. Mountaintops of life are usually followed by a valley. These great successes can be followed by a failure in life because life is a series of stages, right? <laughs> stage one, stage two, like marriage. You know, I don't want to be negative about marriage because I've been married We'll be married. This will be our 42nd, right? 42 years. I don't want to be negative about marriage, but I do want to be realistic enough to tell you that there are stages in marriage. The first stage in marriage is called the happy honeymoon. And the happy honeymoon happens to people who are so in love with each other that they cannot see the warts, the wrinkles, the bruises, the bumps. They don't see any of the negatives. Oh, they're just wonderful, and I love them, and it's going to be a great life together, and we're going to happily go through hand in hand down the hard trails of life, and we will have a wonderful children, and they'll be greatly blessed of the Lord, and they'll... <laughs> well, stage one comes to an end, and stage two, called the party's over, moves <laughs> in. Now, what... What was it that ended stage one and brought stage two in? Let me tell you what it was. Failure. Something didn't work like you thought it was going to work. You found out they got bad breath. <laughs> you, found, you, you found out that they don't know how to put their toothbrush back in the holder in the bathroom, you know, right? They put the toilet roll on opposite of you. It's wrong, you know, over or under. That's the big question of life, right? Well, you begin to see warts and wrinkles and stuff like that, right? That big, wonderful chest just fell down in your drawers. I mean, you still, you still got it, but it ain't like it used to be. The party's over. Well, the same thing happens in life. What, what causes disappointment in life? Failure. Failure. 
We start out high, happy, wonderful, enthusiastic, uh, you know, beautifully motivated, and, uh, and then uh, before long, I mean, then we get, uh, we get angry, we get a little hostile, we get disappointed, we get a little bit bitter, we get a little bit resentful, we get a little, you know, got some, have some regrets. What causes that uh, failure? When in, a few, in a few years from this passage, after about 40, actually, <laughs> Uh, Joshua is going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land 40 years later. Moses, Moses can't go because he hit the rock instead of speaking to it. And God said, you can't go. And uh, I'm going to let you look at it. And Moses was able to look at it, but he couldn't go in. And Joshua led the children of Israel in. And when they went in, the first enemy they faced in the promised land was mighty Jericho. Gigantic city Man, six chariots could run around it. <laughs> it was just, it was awesome. And, 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 and mighty Jericho. And, and so the people said, whoa, God, what are we going to do? What? And the God said, all right, march around it and then have the priest blow those shofars. All right, and then do it again, do it again, do it again. Seven days, seven days, seven days. Last day, march around it seven times and then blow the thing. And when they did that on the last day, the walls just fell down. I mean, it, it, it just, the whole city just imploded. It just, you know, and they just walked right in, got everything. Uh, they defeated mighty Jericho just tremendously. The day after mighty Jericho, they had to go and conquer uh, the, the tiny little wide spot in the road called Ai. Ai. It was about as big as its name. As a matter of fact, they didn't even send all the troops. Moved, uh, moved this, oh, I mean, Joshua said, oh, "Let's just send a few little, you know, send a handful, a couple of, couple of battalions up there. We're gonna take care of that." And uh, man, the AI tore them up one side and down the other, and it was the most tremendous defeat that they had ever had. Well, what is the truth of this for us? Well, the great truth of this is that it's usually the AIs of life that get us. You say, what kind of failure do we experience that, that, that takes us uh, into disappointment? Well, well it, 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 according to this, it, it's not the big things in life. It's, it's those little things. It's those tiny things in life, the small things in life. Because we know what to do with the big things, right? I mean, we have this big, overwhelming, gigantic problem. And it's big, and it's a giant, and it's scary, and it's costly, and it's everything. We know, what do we do? Oh, God, you got to help me, God. I mean, we can't make it without you, God. Oh, come on, man. What do I need to do? Tell me what to do, please. Look, without you, I'm lost. I'm gone. I'm dead. I can't make it, God. You got to do something. We got to need a miracle, God. Come on, please. Let me work. Um, that's what we do with the big stuff because we know we can't handle it. But this little stuff... Oh, man, yeah, we get real presumptuous about that. We cocky, yeah, arrogant. That's all right, God, I got this, I got this. I got this. Do you know that's why he can't tell us more than he does? Do you realize that? Because we're, we'll get like that. He even gives us a hint at what he's going to do. And we'll just start running with it. You know, I mean, he even gives us a hint of what he might want. And, and then we just take off. We got a God. All right. Hey, yeah. All right. I'm going to do this. You're going to do that. Get that. Brother, you come over here and you come. Over. I mean, we just take control and we just start doing our own thing. And it's the small things in life. Why, did, why in the world did God bring Israel to Mara? God brought them there. You know, he did. He led Moses, and Moses led them, and they went to a little wide spot in the road called Mara. Why did God do that? Well, look at the last line. And there he, what? Tested them. Do you know that that's never said about the Red Sea? It's never said about the Red Sea that he tested them at the Red Sea. Why? Why? Because when they got to the Red Sea, they didn't have any faith to be tested. They, I mean, Moses had faith, but they didn't have any faith. So Red Sea wasn't a, taste, a, a test for them. The Red Sea was a revelation of God's character to them. Mara is a revelation of man's character, you know, <laughs> in the small irritations of life. Gripe and complain and blame. So, so what does your disappointment say about you? I mean, what, what, how do you handle your disappointments? I'll tell you how they handled theirs typically. They griped, 
And they grumbled. They complained against their leader. Well, it's Moses' fault. Because it's never your fault. It's always somebody else's fault. And so disappointment it, it, is, it, it uses us that way. So, all right, number one, lesson number one, after every mountain or after most mountains, <laughs> I don't want to be too pessimistic, after most mountaintop experiences, I'm going to experience some failure. I'm going to experience some valleys in life. All right, here's the second lesson. The second lesson is don't serve others in order to be valued. If your motivation in serving other people is that they would somehow value you because of this or appreciate you in some way because of your service to them, let me tell you right now, you are going to be disappointed. Because no matter how much you serve somebody, no matter how long you serve somebody, no matter how well you serve somebody, people quickly forget, don't they? Have you ever noticed that? You have a boss? What does your boss say to you? What have you done for me lately? I mean, let's just forget about all that stuff you've done in the past, like how you saved the company last year. You were salesman of the month two months ago. You know, you stayed over last week, all week long, every night, and worked on a big deal that would bring a lot of revenue for the money. But let, I mean, we're not thinking about that. Let, what have you done for me lately? So if your motivation is serving others to be valued, appreciated, then you're going to be disappointed because in this story, just three days before this complaining at Mara, they had the great miracle at the Red Sea, and now three days later, they're griping, complaining, wanting to impeach Moses. Let's get us a new leader. <laughs> now, I'll just remind you that the Bible tells us how these people were three days ago. Three days ago, these people where the Bible says, and they left Egypt with a high hand. That's the Bible's way of saying that when they, had, when they left Egypt, they were happy, they were bubbling, they were jumping with joy, they were high-fiving each other. Yeah, man, hey, hey. They were singing their praise, you know, Moses, great, I'm great, we're great, God. Oh, what a happy day. And now just three short days later, they have forgotten. They have forgotten in three days, everything that God did to them. So, I, I wrote down a little thing about moms here. I just happened to see it. Uh, did you know there was a study made by Northwestern University on, on the service of, of mothers, that what moms do in a family? I mean, how they serve their family. And they found that, uh, that over a lifetime, most moms serve uh, 35,000 meals, 35,000 meals. Look, I mean, I know you're, some of you moms here, but, but not, but just think about that. 35,000 and make, and make up 40,000 beds. Now, where's her appreciation? Have you thought of, I mean, have you thought about appreciating her or uh, you forgot, right? Right. Yeah, I, well, I forgot. Well, yeah, you have trouble remembering stuff like that. Yeah. Why don't, you, why don't you just put a little note to yourself right now and say, all right, note to self, I need to appreciate my mom. I need to go next week and I need to stop. I need, I need to put my arm around her or, 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 or touch her shoulder or whatever and say, mom, you, man, I, I did, had no idea how much you have sacrificed for me. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate that. You're the most wonderful mother in the world. And then after she wakes up and gets up off the floor, uh, she's going to feel real valuable in life. Because people forget quickly, right? What you did just last week, just yesterday. Oh, yeah, that was nothing, right? Yeah, yeah, that was nothing. It was then, but now it's not. So there are five things I want to see real quick. Five things to do with uh, disappointment when people disappoint you. There are three things that Moses didn't do and two things that he did do. So let's deal with the three things he didn't do first. When somebody disappoints me, 
All right, how am I, what am I going to do with this disappointment? Number one, don't curse it. Now, I didn't say cuss. You know, I didn't, I'm not saying don't say bad words to it. I'm talking about curse. To curse means to pronounce a judgment. Yeah, to pronounce a, a, a judgment against something. In other words, uh, to, uh, to speak evil against it, to uh, uh, try to get even, to try to hurt you like, like the way you know, they hurt you. The typical response of Moses in this situation, think about it. You're Moses. Think about it a second. You're Moses. You just led the children out. You parted the Red Sea. You've got the staff of God. You've been in a 10-round fight with Pharaoh to get them out of there, those crybabies are crying, begging God, and then you get called to a bush and get sent down there to get them out of there. Now you got to go back down in there and do what you didn't want to do. You 80 years old, you thought it was time to retire. God said, no, you're going to refire, and you're, gonna, you're in for the biggest adventure of your life. He thought he was going to get on Social Security. He got on Social Insecurity. I mean, he just got the biggest adventure of his life. And he goes down there and he does all that God tells him to do. And he gets them out and gets them over the Red Sea, gets them out there into the wilderness. Hey, man, look, right over there is the promised land. Let's go that way. And, uh, and they, all they can do is gripe and complain and grumble and bellyache about everything. What would you have said? It would have been typical for Moses to look at him and say, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right if that's the way you feel about it, man, uh, I'm out of here. Uh, you're going to have to fend for yourself. Good luck. Hope you can find a way. You got a map. I'm going home. Well, how, how do you handle? How do you handle when you handle it when you get your feelings hurt or when somebody disappoints you in life? Now, be honest. If you'll be honest about it, whenever you get hurt in life, most of the time, you spend a good bit of time uh, and a good bit of creative energy thinking of some way to get back at them, right? Thinking of some way to get them like they got you. Or better, if you can get them uh, and they don't even know that it, you know, that, that it was you and you can, <laughs> you, know, you can pull that off, baby, that would be the trifecta of, uh, of revenge in life. Do you, are you aware that once you start defending yourself, God stops defending you? Are you aware of this? If you want to just defend yourself, go right ahead. But who would you rather have defending you? Would you rather you defend yourself or would you rather God defend you? Because that's a choice. Because when, when, when you start defending yourself, God stops. Now, I'm going to lay something on you real heavy and go real quick about this because I, 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 I just need to say this because when I was preparing this this week, the Lord was dealing with my heart about it. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I'm probably the guilty, one of the most guilty people here of unforgiveness in this church building. I mean, I, am, I have a little dungeon in my heart where I got some people in it. And I just walk down in there every once in a while and torture them <laughs> and then close the door and come back out. So the Lord started dealing with me this week about it on this point right here about how to, about, about how to, to get that anger and that disappointment out of you. Why, why do I still have it after 25 years or 30 years? Why, why, why is it in there, some of it 15 years? Why is that still inside of me and still troubling me? Because I haven't dealt with it. That's why I haven't forgiven these people. I don't want to. They deserve it. They did me wrong. They, 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 they mistreated. They did some stuff. Well, if I don't deal with that, then I'm the one that's going to be injured by this. I mean, here I am 25 years later on some of these people been in there 25 years. So how do you do that? Well, I'm going to put two verses up that I believe the Lord showed me in, in, in the Scripture. And, and there are many script verses, but this is just two of them. In Luke 6, 28, bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And then Romans, bless those who persecute you, bless them and do not curse them is what that means. You know what that says? 
I've got to forgive. That says I've got to be able to pray for somebody who has hurt me. I have to pray that God would bless them. Pray for those. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Those. Clearly, God says, all right, here's how you get over this stuff. You start praying that I'll bless them. And then I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, all right, if I start praying that you bless them and then you actually do bless them, me and you're going to have a problem. <laughs> so, but here, here's, what, here's what came out of it, of the whole deal. Look, if I can't pray for them to be blessed, then I haven't forgiven them. Now, it doesn't mean you got to get back in business with them or you got to become their best friend or you got to get in a position where they can hurt you again like they did before. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that you pray that God will bless them legitimately. God bless. So, and here's what the promise I think I got from the Lord, because I said to him, I'm, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm, I don't want that. And here's what I think the Lord spoke to my heart and said, if you will do this, if you'll do it, you, when, every morning you, you pray, you, you, you line them up, however many it is, and you start praying that I will bless them. I'll take this out of your heart. And, and if you'll just start, start praying it and just keep on praying it now until you get released is kind of the way the Lord put it. it. Might not happen the first day, second day, third day. It might take 10 days. It might take two weeks that I'm legitimately going to pray for God's blessings on the people that I have in this little prison house in my heart that I love to torture and want bad stuff to happen to them. I'm going to pray for them and bless and ask the Lord to bless them because you can't stay, you can't keep unforgiveness against somebody that you're praying for every day. I, I, I just, I, I just, you can't convince me that you could hold unforgiveness if you're praying for God to bless them every day. Uh, though that would be just, uh, that, that would be a cognitive dissonance, you know? I mean, it just wouldn't happen. So I'm just telling you, okay, if you're not gonna curse it, when somebody disappoints you and makes you angry, blah, blah, all right, you're not gonna curse it, you're not gonna curse them, you're not gonna speak a judgment against them, you're not gonna be evil, you're not gonna try to get even, you're not gonna retaliate, you're not gonna try to get back, you're gonna have to forgive. That's the only way to release it. To release yourself is what it boils down to. All right, I told you, that was a heavy, and okay, we're gone, pass it. Did y'all get that, by the way? Okay, well, don't tell me what you think about it. Just go on with it. All right, <laughs> number two, don't, now remember three things he didn't do. He didn't curse it. Number two, he didn't rehearse it. Now, to rehearse it, I mean, he didn't keep going over and over it in his mind. Uh, you know, you, you, you just keep letting this thing come back and you just keep thinking about it all over again. And uh, let me give you a verse in Psalm 37. It says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. By the way, do you know what wrath means? Wrath is the outward explosion of anger. Like when you tell your child to clean up his room and he doesn't want to. And you say, you get in there and clean that room up and then you pick up the board of education. <laughs> and, then, and then they go in that room and they slam that door, that's wrath. When you tell them, no, you can't do that and they get in their car and squeal out the driveway, that's wrath. The outward expression of anger is wrath. He says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. Why? It only causes harm. For me to rehearse these things and to keep them fresh in my mind uh, and to keep, them, keep going over them and over and, and over them in, in our mind, it just makes them get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, your life becomes consumed by it. 
and you fall out of disappointment and into resentment and hostility and anger and wrath and <laughs> retaliation and everything else. So we don't curse it and we don't rehearse it. And then here's the third one, we don't nurse it. <laughs> to nurse it, I mean feed it. I mean give it, give it its growth, give it its food. Uh, he, keep it alive. There, there's a song, and I love it, and Justin sing. well, I think everybody in the praise team has sung it at one time or another. It's called, Oh, How He Loves. Remember this Crowder song, Oh, How He Loves? And it has a line in it that I, I just, this is just a tremendously great line, and it hits me every time they sing this line. It says, and heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. Here's the line, and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves me. I don't have time to maintain these regrets. Regrets have to be maintained. Hurts have to be fed. They have to be cared for. They have to be nursed in order to stay alive in you. You have to feed them and you have to get on your little pity pot and get your little party hat and your little blower and <laughs> and say, they've been, they've been so bad to me. You got to climb down in that dungeon and torture them a little bit and then climb out. You have to maintain regrets in life. Ephesians 4, look at this. This is a very familiar passage. And, and be angry and do not sin, just like I was telling you. You can be angry and not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Now, the only thing I want to say about that in connection with this don't nurse it thing is that right there is saying to me that if I let disappointment hang around, why should I not let the sun go down on my wrath? I don't need to let that junk hang around. If I let it hang around to sundown, it's going to get a foothold in me. I got to get that stuff out quick or it's going to do damage on the inside of me. And so uh, don't let disappointment hang around. Human nature, uh, when you get disappointed or hurt, is to draw up into a shell and, 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 and sit and lay in there and think about uh, what happened to you, how it happened, what you're going to do next time, what you should have done, what you should have said, how you should have acted, what you're going to do. If they say this, I'm going to do this. And they, I mean, you just roll it, roll it, roll it, and you're just feeding it, feeding it, feeding it, and then it grows into resentment. Can you imagine the, Paul, the Apostle Paul doing that? And you imagine, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, by the way, 2 Timothy is the last book Paul ever wrote. Chapter 4 is the last chapter in 2 Timothy. And so that's the last chapter he ever wrote. And verses that talk about the people in his life that disappointed him are in the last few verses of chapter 4. So that's some of the last things he wrote in the book. Man, he was disappointed. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present age. Beware of Alexander the coppersmith. He looks good, but he'll do you harm, you know. <laughs> All right. He said, man, Demas has forsaken me. And he said, uh, bring John Mark because he's good for me. You know, I mean, I mean, could you imagine that? Could you imagine that the, the Apostle Paul said, man, all these people have just hurt me. And John Mark hopped out on me. And when he did, that's it. And I'm going home to watch the Super Bowl. You know? No. Or could you imagine Jesus doing this? Could you imagine Jesus getting home to heaven early? He didn't go to the cross. He gets there early, and one of the angels see him, and one of the angels says, hey, man, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I had a bad experience down there. Do you know that some of those people didn't even believe in me? And it just, I, frankly, it just hurt my, my feelings. And you know what I decided? I decided it wasn't worth it. So I'll just let them fend for themselves. I mean, can you imagine this? you imagine Jesus doing that? No, don't, don't curse it, don't rehearse it, don't nurse it. And then here's one thing that you do. You must disperse it. I know this is a cutie, but <laughs> still think about it. You must disperse it. To disperse means to uh, get it out. So what did Moses do? When these people griped and complained, what did he do? Let's go back to verse 25. What, read the first four or five words. So he cried out to the Lord. 
When those people started griping and complaining, he just cried out to the Lord. And, 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 and so what I'm saying to you is don't gripe and com- grumble and mutter and spurt and get your feelings hurt and, 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 and bellyache and complain to each other. Look, you, Brian, as great a man as he is, can't do anything about it. Jim can't do anything about it. Bren can't do anything about it. Jimmy can't do anything about it. Virginia can't do anything about it. Why do I need to talk to her about it? I mean, I, mean I'm a, I want her on my side. Is that what it is? You want somebody to agree with you? you want to, you're trying to marshal up some forces to get back at somebody and kind of mount a counterattack? You're trying to feed the spirit of sedition, Absalom and Jezebel? Is that what, is that what you're doing? Because if, you, if that's not what you're doing, you're headed right at that. Don't talk to people about this stuff. Let it go to God. God can do something about it. All of these people can't do a single thing about it. And what does the Lord say to us? The Lord says, cast all your care on me because I care for you. So he invites us to do this. Moses cried out to the Lord. So you don't curse it. You don't rehearse it. You don't nurse it. You disperse it and you give it to God and let God reverse it. Yeah, let God reverse it. Mm -hmm. God can turn it around, can't he? Can God turn stuff around? Yeah, there's a verse we all love, Romans 8, 28. I called it 4, Philippians 4, 28 the other day, but it's not. It's, it's, it's Romans 8, 28. Uh, what does it say? For we know that sometimes stuff works for us. For we know that, yeah, we know that, that all things work together for uh, mediocrity, <laughs> no, for good to those who are called according to God. That includes disappointment, by the way. God can take something that disappoints us and hurts us, and God can turn it around. I mean, you know, if anybody had the right to be disappointed, it would have to be Joseph in the Bible. You remember Joseph, the coat of many colors? You remember him? He was the son, and he got he had dad loved him, gave him the coat, and then the brothers got all jealous and hated him because he, he got the coat, and they stripped his coat off of him and took some animal blood and put on it, and they sold him to the Midianites that were going down to Egypt, and the Midianites took him down to Egypt, sold him to Potiphar. Potiphar, uh, he was Potiphar's servant for a long time, and then he was a teenager, good-looking young man, and Potiphar's wife decided she wanted to you know, be intimate with him. And he said no. And then she got her feelings hurt and said, accused him of raping her anyway. And so he got thrown into prison for years, for two years and three years. And then he met the baker and the butler in there and they had the dreams. And then one of them got out, the baker got out and said, don't forget me when you get up there to Pharaoh. And he says, man, I won't forget you. And then all of a sudden, two years later, Pharaoh has a dream and the baker goes, oh my goodness. I mean, the butler goes, oh my goodness. I forgot about my boy. He said, there's a little guy down in the prison house that can interpret that dream for you. And Joseph comes out and interprets the dream and becomes second in command in all of Egypt. And he builds those silos and he saves the grain. And then when the whole world pretty much is in famine, including Israel, Joseph's brothers have to come down to Egypt to see him, to try to get some grain, to keep themselves alive and the nation of Israel alive. And they don't know it's Joseph, but he does know it's them. And so there's his brothers in front of him, the ones that did evil, the ones that sold him, the ones that told dad he was dead, the ones that, that, that all of this torture and punishment and evil came upon him about. There they are standing right in front of him and they don't even know it's him begging for food. <laughs> well, what was his attitude about this? His attitude was what? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He saved not only his family, but he saved all of Israel. Lots of folks are going to disappoint us, some of them on purpose. They want us to fail. They want to hurt us in life. They mean it for evil. But God can use it for good. So now because Moses responded properly, in verse 25, he cried out to the Lord. He didn't, he didn't curse it. He didn't uh, rehearse it. He didn't nurse it. He, 
He, gave, he dispersed it, and he let God reverse it. Because he did that, notice what? The Lord cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And this tree was so special that when he threw the tree into the water, the bitter water was made sweet. Certainly, I mean, you put, you put this together, right? Certainly, this is a foreshadowing of another tree that'll be thrown in to make bitterness sweet. But it says God showed him a tree. What does that mean? What does that imply? It implies that the tree was there all along, right? It didn't say, and God hurried up and made him a tree so he could throw something in there. He said, no, he said he showed it to him, which means that it was there all along. And, and if Moses had been pouting and sullen and getting his pity party pot out and his pity party hat and all of his balloons, he would have never been able to see the answer to his problem. So in handling bitterness, realize that after every mountain or most mountaintops, comes a valley, uh, realize that if you're trying to, if your motivation is to serve people so you can be appreciated and all that, just get ready to be disappointed, then this one other thing. Now I'm fixing to quit, so y'all, y'all, I, I can see you shifting, so I can tell you're getting tired. <laughs> Number three. Number three, grab a knot and hang on. One of my favorite sayings. You know why? Because it's so true. Sometimes you just gotta, you, look, you gotta just grab a knot and hang on because Many, many things in life will turn around if you will not quit. If you will just grab a knot and hang on, God is going to turn it around. God is going to do something about it and if, if, if you will not quit. Our problem is too often we give up too soon. We quit when God has a miracle right over the next hill. We quit. Uh, last verse of this whole thing. I mean, it's kind of a strange little deal. Then they, then they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Uh, 12 springs, 70 palms. 12 springs, 70 palms. Palm springs. <laughs> palm springs. Uh, paradise. Uh, vacation right out here in the middle of the Sinai. I mean, Wow, that, that is the most amazing thing. And, 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 and how far is Elam from Mara? You know, at Mara, they've stopped. They're griping, complaining, the water's bitter, grumbling, mumbling, feelings hurting, all that. And, and, then, and then Moses does his thing. And then the next thing that happens, they just start walking. And right over the hill, from where their little grumble fest happened back here, was 12 springs and 70 palm trees right over the next hill. <laughs> and how did they get there? How did they get there? I mean, when at Mara, they're griping and complaining, and then Moses throws in and makes the bitter water sweet, and then God drag, gets Elam and drags Elam right back there to Mara. Is that how it happened? Negatory. That's not how it happened. How it happened was... When God did what he did at Mara, they started walking again. They started moving on, moving on forward in life. They didn't stop at Mara and God dragged something back to Mara. No, they, they went forward. They went on. Uh, uh, um, Elam is only five miles. If you, put, if you look at it on a map, Elam is five miles from Mara. That's what it is. And as soon as God did his thing, then they began to move and 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 and. And Elam was right around the corner. So, so what, is, what, is, what is the lesson about that? The lesson about that is don't quit because Elam is <laughs> right around the corner. Yeah. God brought them to Mara to do what to them? To test them. To see what was in them. To test them. And when they passed the test, then God brought them to Elam. They got there. Because they kept moving on, they kept going on, they grabbed a knot and they hang on. Uh, what, what is it that you feel like giving up today? A job? You feel like quitting on your marriage? Is that what it is that you feel like doing? I mean, you, you want to quit with your family? You had a falling out? I mean, it's time to, qu to quit, Dad? Is it, 
And we'll quit church. You know, God's a complete disappointment. That preacher preaches way too long. I mean, what is it you want to quit? God may take you tomorrow, but if you'll keep moving, if you won't quit, he won't leave you tomorrow. He brings you tomorrow to test you. Once you pass the test, he takes you to the land of blessing. From the land of bitterness to the land of blessing. Hang on. It's right around the corner. Thank you.